What do you delight in? What brings you joy or pleasure? When was the last time you truly adored something? To delight is to be greatly pleased, and Psalm 119 is full of this wonder. It is the longest chapter in the Bible and likens his word to honey for our lips and a lamp to our feet. There is joy, freedom, and praise to be found in this psalm. God's word is worthy of our delight and is written to connect us to Jesus. Hi, church. Welcome to The Rock. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors. We're continuing our study of Psalm 119. We've been delighting in God's word for 11 weeks now. Brian's going to wrap up this series next week, and then we're going to get into Easter. So this is part 11. Grab your handout. Titled this message, The Clarity of Scripture. So a power review. The book of Psalms is a collection of worship songs written to help believers praise God. Psalms are like this honest pouring out of thoughts and feelings to God, and it's a shaping of right thinking before God. And so the chapter that we're studying, Psalm 119, is the longest chapter in the Bible. It has 176 verses broken into 22 different sections, eight verses long, and every section starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So let's read another eight-verse section. Every section, every verse in this section starts with the letter Mem. It's the second row down, second letter over. We're going to be in verses 97 to 104. It's on your handout. Grab your Bible. Grab your Bible app. Or here it is in Hebrew. So there you go. I'm going to read Psalm 119, 97 to 104. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged or the elders, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Amen. There's some incredible verses. We're going to unpack them pretty quickly, and then we're going to camp on a big idea for this teaching. But I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump into it. Lord, we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you for a chance to worship you. I just loved listening to my brothers and sisters singing loud, praising the Lord. And I thank you, God, that we can study your word right now. I ask, God, that your spirit would be moving through this room tonight, that you would teach us by the power of your Holy Spirit through your word. We say all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So before we get into Psalm 119, I want to set up our big idea. Isaiah 55, this is God speaking. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. So in this chapter, God is speaking about his compassion for people, but he makes this statement, God, the creator of the universe, is so far above his creation, like the heavens are above the earth. And last week, Bill did a little astronomy lesson. I loved it, so I thought we'd continue the astronomy lesson. So how far is that? How far are the heavens above the earth? I'm glad you asked. So according to the Googles, the closest star to our solar system is Proxima Centauri, which is 25 trillion miles away. And the fastest a person has ever traveled in recorded history was in the Apollo mission When the astronauts were going to the moon in 1969, they traveled at 25,000 miles per hour. So if you have to go 25 trillion miles at 25,000 miles per hour, it will take you a short 114,000 years to get there. So bottom line, verse 9, God's thoughts are a lot higher than our thoughts. So with that passage in mind, let's study our verses Look at how the author loves the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 97. He says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. If we're honest, sometimes when we think about our Bible reading, we think of it as duty or obligation. But the author of Psalm 119 is operating on a whole different level. Oh, how I love your law. Could we say that? Do we love God's word? 
We love all kinds of things. We love our house projects, friends and family. We love music and sports. We love mountains. We love skiing. We love vacations. We love pizza. We love our favorite show. We love our dog. We love our cat. But how many of us would be like, I love the Bible. Notice how his love for God's word motivates him to meditate on it. When we think of meditation, we probably think of this, somebody sitting, they're doing this with their hands, and they're going, they're cleared their mind, they're like, um. <laughs> but biblical meditation is different. It's not clearing your mind, it's focusing your mind, it's digging into God's word. The, in biblical meditation, the person deliberately quiets their mind to meditate and fill it with God's word. What is this verse saying about me? What is this verse teaching me in my life and teaching me about God? It's memorizing the word. It's praying about the word. It's thinking deeply about the word. You can increase your love for God's word by meditating on it. So your first blank on your handout, how can you meditate more on God's word this week? You know, the more you think about something affectionately, the more you're going to love it. And the inverse is true. The less you think about something, the less you'll love it. So now the author is going to talk about how God's word has benefited him with three groups, his enemies, his teachers, and the elders or the aged or people with more experience. So verse 98, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies for it is ever with me. So the humble believer who knows God's word is wiser than his enemies. What is wisdom? Here's one definition of wisdom, the ability to judge correctly and to follow the best course of action based on knowledge, understanding, and experience. So you want to be wiser than the people that are against you. Meditate on God's word. Think deeply on God's word. And then the second group, teachers, in verse 99, he says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. So before we unpack this verse, I need to say, the Bible is pro-teachers. Jesus was obviously a powerful teacher. There's countless examples of godly teachers throughout the Bible. Pastors are called to teach their church. So this is not a renouncement of teaching and teachers and education. But your second blank, our understanding of God's word is not limited to our teachers. You can learn from your own study of the Bible. The author of Psalm 119 is saying his teachers did not base their teaching on the Bible, so he's wiser than them. He has more understanding than them. This means the ultimate source of knowledge and understanding and wisdom is God's word. So being educated doesn't make you wise. Having a bunch of degrees doesn't make you wise. Charles Spurgeon, the pastor, talked about it this way. He said, we may hear the wisest teachers and remain fools, but if we meditate, think deeply upon the sacred word, we must become wise. There is more wisdom in the testimonies of the Lord than in all of the teachings of men. If they were all gathered in one vast library, the one book outweighs all the rest. Amen. We're not anti-education around here. We believe in getting a good education. I was well-educated growing up. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in engineering. Chris and I are striving to educate our kids well. We've encouraged them to go down the path of higher education. If you read your Bible, there are godly people that are well-educated. I think of like Daniel and Moses and Paul. But if you read your Bible, you see there are godly people that were not well-educated, like Peter, James, and John. But as Christians, we're not anti-education. We just simply know there's more to life than book smarts. Your third blank. Any instruction not ultimately based on God's law is inferior. This means that any really smart teacher, if they don't know God's word, they can't teach you wisdom. They cannot teach you how to live a godly life. They can't teach you the way of salvation. Your teacher at school may be super educated, but if they're teaching you something about transgenderism or sexuality or gender that goes against God's word, they're fools. God's word makes you wiser than them if you're meditating on it. Remember that verse in Psalms that says, a fool says in his heart there is no God? So any teacher, I don't care how good they are at math or science or history or English, if they don't know God, the Bible says ultimately they're a fool. And you see that word meditate here in verse 99. Again, we're talking about thinking deeply about the word, reading it, studying it, memorizing it. 
This means you don't just scan a chapter and call it good. Knowing God's word takes focus. And now the third group, the aged or the elders in the Hebrew, people older than you, people with more experience. Verse 100, I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. So in the author's time, the aged, the elders were well respected. He's not anti-elderly. There's a bunch of verses that talk about respecting your elders. But we're not talking about here people that are wise and godly and older. We're just talking about people that have been around the block and they've seen some things. They say stuff to you like, son, I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. (laughs) But being old, having a lot of experience, having been around the block doesn't make you wise. The author's study of God's word makes him wiser and gives him more understanding than people that have more years or more experience. And notice this isn't just about understanding God's word. He says, for I keep your precepts. He says, I understand more because I keep your precepts. I obey. Our culture incorrectly believes that the experienced person knows more, but it's here we see it's the person that obeys God's word that knows more. Your fourth blank. Any experience not ultimately based on God's law is inferior. So it's not about your age. It's not about your degree. It's not about what you would put on your resume, your expertise, your experience. It's not the letters that you put behind your name. It's about knowing and obeying the book. Next verse, 101. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. D.L. Moody, the evangelist, he famously put it this way. He said, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. That's so true. The author knows what he should and should not do because he knows God's word. Like we talked about a couple weeks ago, this is the people we spend time with. These are the shows we watch, the apps we use, the conversations we engage in, the music we listen to, the websites we visit. The author of Psalm 119 knows God's word, therefore knows how God wants him to walk, and so he doesn't walk in evil paths. You see how there's a direct connection in this verse between knowing God's word, obedience, they're linked together. In other words, if you don't obey God's word, you're not going to understand God's word. Our next verse, 102. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. This is our theme verse for the teaching. I do not turn aside from your word, because you have taught me. Who taught him? God. God taught him. God taught the author of Psalm 119. And Christian, the next blank, number five, God can teach you as you study his book. That's a remarkable thought. God will teach you as you study and obey his book. The creator of the universe can be your teacher. God's word is clear and understandable. That's the big idea of this teaching. You don't need an interpreter. You don't need a translator. Even though God's thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts, God chose to put his thoughts in a book to teach us. That's remarkable. 114,000 years to reach the nearest star. We worship a God whose thoughts are higher than that, but God chose to put his thoughts in a book that you can read and study and understand and obey. We're going to come back to this big idea, but let's talk about the last two verses. 103. Caleb covered this verse back in January. 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And notice it's plural words. It's not singular word. So this means the individual books and chapters and verses and phrases and words of the Bible are sweet. Caleb taught us back in January, this is about cultivating a taste for God's word, how God's word should be our delight and not a duty or obligation. I enjoy candy, so this verse really resonates with me. Hebrew candy was honey. That was like old school Jewish candy, and I love fireballs and Skittles and lifesavers, and I like all the candies. I don't even know what these candies are, but I'd probably eat them. Again, this verse isn't talking about duty. It's talking about delight. It's not, oh, I have to read the Bible. It's I get to read the Bible. It's like candy. 
If you don't delight in the word of God, it raises the question, what are you filling up with instead? Our last verse before we explore our big idea, 104. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Two weeks ago, we talked about this love-hate contrast. Here we have another love-hate contrast. Our first verse, 97, he says he loves the word of God. Here, 104, he hates every false way. So it begins with loving God's truth. It ends with hating evil. If you study God's truth, eventually you end up hating things that are against God's truth. For example, you study God's word, you see how God has made every person with value and worth and dignity, even from conception. And so you hate the evil of killing unborn children. Or you look at God's word and you see, oh, God looks at the inside. God looks at the heart. God looks at the character of people. We're all wrapped up with the outside. God's looking at the inside. And so you hate evil of partiality or favoritism or racism. Or you study God's word, you see how God has this amazing plan for sexual pleasure in marriage between a husband and wife. And so you hate it when you see sexual sin or you hear about sexual sin around you. The more you love God's book, the more you hate evil. That's what this verse is saying. So there's a bunch of incredible themes in these verses, but for our remaining time, I wanna talk about the clarity of scripture. That's our big idea. God's word is knowable, it's understandable, it's clear. You can sit down, you can read this book, study it, understand it, to obey it. I started with Isaiah 55 because I want us to understand God's thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. But God, the creator of the universe, chose to put his thoughts in a book that we can read and understand. We can know the unknowable. We can begin to understand the mind of God. We don't need to be educated, verse 99. We don't have to have a lot of experience, verse 100. You can sit down, read your Bible, study it, understand it, and obey it. That's the big idea, your sixth blank. God's word is knowable. This is the clarity of scripture. God, the Bible is knowable because God wants to be known by you. He wants you to read his book, to understand it and obey it and all those things. But ultimately, God wants you to know him through his book. I've always loved this verse in Acts. This is Paul speaking at Mars Hill or the Areopagus. Paul says this in Acts 17, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he's actually not far from each one of us. God wants you to find him. And obviously the first way God reveals himself to us is through creation. In Romans chapter one, it says this, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so they are without excuse. This is what theologians call general revelation. We look around the world, and we see the design and the purpose and the beauty. We go, oh, God made this. But God doesn't just leave us there at general revelation. He gives us special revelation. He takes it deeper. He gives us the Bible. This book, the Bible, it's clear, it's knowable, it's understandable. In other words, it has clarity. So in Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 1 through 30, Moses gives this big, long 30-chapter speech before he dies. And in uh, chapter 29, Moses says this, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. God revealed his thoughts to us through the Bible. When you open your Bible, that's God speaking to you, and it's clear. When I say the clarity of Scripture, this is what I mean. It's the saving message of Jesus is plainly taught in the Scriptures and can be understood by all who have ears to hear it. We don't need a religious representative to tell us what the Bible means. Basically, what I'm telling you right now is you don't need the pastors. God can teach you through his book. You, God, and his book, and God can teach you. I was talking to a brother that goes to the church here yesterday, and he said, I cracked open my Bible, and I read this verse, and God spoke to me about a situation. That's what I'm talking about. 
Now, God has called the pastors to teach you and equip you and encourage you. It says because he loves you. But any pastor or spiritual leader who starts to divert from the Bible, then they're wrong. That's why the author says in verse 99 again, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. When you are digging deeply into God's word, you can see when a teacher is starting to get off course. Now, it's very clear if you're at school and a teacher or some politician or some online influencer, they tell you some lie about money or entertainment or pleasure or parenting or marriage or whatever. It's very clear when they're lying if you actually know God's word. But even supposed Bible teachers can be wrong. That's why knowing God's word deeply can make you wiser than your teachers. You should not care how famous a preacher is or how many followers someone has or if a bunch of people recommended a book. If it has diverted from God's word, it's wrong. I don't care what they think about gender roles. They're going against the Bible. They're wrong. I don't care what they think about creation. They're going against the Bible. They're wrong. I don't care what they think about the gospel. They're going against the Bible. They're wrong. I don't care what he thinks about how he should treat his wife. He's going against the Bible. He's wrong. Go back to Deuteronomy, Moses' 30-chapter sermon before he dies. This is an encouraging part. Deuteronomy 30, Moses says this, This commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Verse 13, Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart that you can do it. That's encouraging. God's word is near to you. It's clear. It's understandable. You know, over the years when I've had spiritual conversations with people, sometimes they can be frustrating. I'm trying to explain something. I'm like, well, look right here. It says right here in this verse right here. Read it. Let's read it. And they're like, I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't know what that means. I think they do know what it means. I think it's easier to say, oh, I'm not a Bible scholar. This passage is encouraging. God's commands are not too hard for us. It says God's word is very near to you. It literally says, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> what a great passage. You don't have to go up to heaven to get God's word. He brought it down to you. You don't have to cross the ocean to go hear from some mystic. You can read it and understand it and study it and obey it because it's clear. We're talking about the clarity of Scripture. We can go to this book and get answers for life. You know that was the pattern of Jesus Christ. Many times Jesus just went right to the Old Testament to settle a matter, to answer a question, to tell people what they needed to hear, to handle temptation. Jesus thought regular people could pick up the Bible, read it, and understand it. For example... I've got a bunch. Buckle up. Jesus is being tempted. Luke 4, Jesus answered Satan. He says, it is written, and he quotes the Old Testament. Luke 4, Jesus answered Satan. It is written, and he quotes the Old Testament. Luke 4, the third time, Jesus answered Satan. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He quotes the Old Testament. Uh, Matthew 9, go learn what this means. He quotes the Old Testament. Matthew 12, he said to them, have you not read what David did? Tells a story from the Old Testament. Matthew 12 again, have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath? Tells him another Old Testament story. Matthew 19, Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Matthew 21, Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read? He quotes the Old Testament. Matthew 21 again, he said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? Quotes the Old Testament. Matthew 22, but Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Matthew 22, as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? And then Mark 12, as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses? That's remarkable to me. Jesus is tempted, he goes to the book. Somebody asks him a question, he goes to the book. Someone needs truth, he goes to the book. Jesus believed that regular people could read the book and get the information they needed to live their life. 
If you have a question about temptation or marriage or gender or judgment or creation or divorce or eternity or the gospel or sexuality, have you not read? Haven't you read? Haven't you read? The answers are in there. You can read it. You can study it. You can understand it. You can obey it because it's clear. This is like simultaneously convicting and encouraging. We're like, we have the answers. And you're like, oh, we have the answers. Jesus believed the Bible had clarity. You could understand it. Jesus believed the Bible has authority. You can obey it. Your next blank, number seven. Jesus approached God's word as if it could be known and understood by ordinary people. That's me and you, ordinary people. You know what is kind of sad or ironic to me today? Sometimes people, Christians, in an attempt to be more winsome, they kind of muddy up the water. They're like, I don't know, maybe it says that, maybe it doesn't, but let's ignore that part and talk about this part over here. In our attempt to win someone to Christ, we can sell them a bill of goods. But then that person, they start reading the Bible like, whoa, you lied to me. (laughs) That's not what the book says. The book says this or that or whatever cultural pressure we're feeling right now. If we aren't clear with the scripture, we're not following Jesus' example over and over again. Have you not read? It is written. Have you never read? Don't you know the book? As lovingly and as kindly as possible, tell them what God's word says. Let that be the point of debate in their mind. Am I going to believe and obey what God said? That should be the point of the debate. What was Satan's first lie in the garden? Did God really say? Remember in Genesis chapter 2, God created Adam. He put him in the garden. He said this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You shall surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that was God's command to Adam. And then Eve was created. Adam and Eve are working in the garden. Satan arrives, tempts Eve. And look at Satan's deception. Genesis 3, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So what does Satan say? Did God actually say? Eve modifies it. She has this little don't touch bonus. That's been the playbook of Satan and confused Christians for thousands of years. Did God actually say, or let me modify that for you. (laughs) So quiz, can God, the creator of the universe, communicate with his people clearly, sufficiently? Yes, he can. This means you don't need Bible scholars. You don't need Greek and Hebrew commentators. You don't need Roman or Jewish cultural understandings, which are all amazing, by the way. But I like how the professor, author R.C. Sproul put it. He said, what kind of God would reveal his love and redemption in terms so technical and concepts so profound that only an elite core of professional scholars could understand them? Amen. There's a pastor, Kevin DeYoung. He wrote a great book, Knowing God, about knowing the Bible. It's on your handout. He has a list in that book. I put the book title on the back of your hand up, but I want to briefly unpack these. I think they're worth mentioning. These are guidelines regarding the clarity of Scripture. Some portions of Scripture are clearer than others. Not every passage has a simple or obvious meaning. The main thing we need to know, believe, and do can be clearly seen in the Bible. Though the most essential doctrines are not equally clear in every passage, they're all made clear somewhere in Scripture. That which is necessary for salvation can be understood even by the uneducated, provided they make use of the ordinary means of study and learning. And then number five, the most important points in Scripture may not be understood perfectly, but they can be understood sufficiently. Those are good. Here's our last blank. The clarity of Scripture means that regular people, using regular means, can understand what must be known, believed, and lived as a godly Christian. Amen? Do you believe that? Most importantly, more importantly, does your Bible study, do your Bible study habits demonstrate you actually believe that? So I want to briefly give you just a few Bible study habits. These are in no particular order. 
These are habits related to studying the Bible. Number one, read it every day. Read the whole book. Read the Bible in a year. Just spend a year in the book of Romans. Dig into it. Log some years. Read the book. You can't study the book if you don't read the book. Number two, pray for God's understanding. We will not understand the word of God without God's help. It says in Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes that I may see the wonders that are in your law. Make that your prayer. God, help me understand this book today as I read it. Number three, read with a heart to obey God's word. Like we discussed, obeying the book is key to understanding the book. If you don't obey it, you will not understand it. Number four, utilize a variety of Bible study tools. We are blessed to live in a day and age with incredible books and commentaries and websites and apps and teachers and all these tools right at our fingertips. I could email you a list of some that I like to use. Number five, listen to a handful of good Bible teachers. Why a handful? If you listen to one, you're a clone. If you listen to two, you're confused. If you listen to a handful of teachers, you're starting to get a heart of wisdom. I can email you some good Bible teachers. And you guys are blessed to be in a church with a bunch of good Bible teachers. Uh, number six, this is an important one. I need you all to lock in right now. <laughs> Run your thoughts questions, observations by other believers and your pastors. Our study of God's word should never be detached from other believers, Christian history, Christian tradition, and your pastors and Bible scholarship. This is really important so you don't start a cult. <laughs> Someday, when the FBI is smashing down your door of your compound and you and your polygamous wives are hiding, You'll be like, I should have locked into point six. <laughs> and then number seven, understand study of the word is a lifelong process. It doesn't happen overnight. When I was in high school, I started reading the word of God seriously. It takes years. I've been studying the book for 30 years now. It takes time to study God's word. And again, I'd be happy to email you some resources if you want to dig in. So as we bring this to a close, how many of you have ever thought, you know, I'd love it if God would just like, when I woke up, God just like spoke to me audibly. That God just told me what I needed to know. You know that that can happen every single day. Every word of God was written to teach you and convict and encourage and instruct and help you. When you read your Bible, that's God speaking to you. And because of the clarity of Scripture, when you open your Bible, you can read it and study it and understand it to obey it. So I want to read that passage from Deuteronomy 30 again. I'm just going to read it to you. I think it's really good. For this command that I command, this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off, nor is it in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us? that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. No, but the word is very near to you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart so you can do it. Amen? Thank God for the clarity of scripture. Lord, we thank you that you, your thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts as the heavens are above the earth, but you chose to put them in this book because you love us. And you want us to find you. And God, there are men and women here who are not Christians. I pray that they would study your book and they would find the way of salvation. And God, for those of us that know you, Lord, help us to understand that your book has clarity, that we can read it and we can understand it. And you are speaking to us day to day when we open our Bible. That is your voice speaking to us. God, I pray that we would be a church that doesn't walk around thinking we need an interpreter that we would know and understand that your word is clear. And I just, the example of Christ, have you not read? Have you not read? May that be our heart, Lord. May we be men and women that just go to your book for the answers in life. We say all this in your name. Amen.